Welcome to another edition of RCE. This is your host, Brock Palin, and we're going to be speaking today about cluster building. Um, I have with us three people. I have my co-host, Jeff Squires from Cisco. Greetings. This is Jeff Squires. I, I work on uh, OpenMPI. You can find me on open-mpi.org. Uh, and I have our other two guests. First, we have Jeff Layton from Dell. How you doing, Brock? Uh, yeah, my name is Jeff Layton. I'm what we call the enterprise technologist for HPC at Dell. So, you know, rather than spend an hour explaining what, what an enterprise technologist is, we can just go ahead and move on. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. And then we have Doug Eggline from Cluster Monkey. Hi. Um, and Cluster Monkey is a uh, HPC site, clustermonkey.net. Um, and uh, some of you may know me from Linux Magazine, where I also write um, an HPC column every week and some articles. And uh, uh, I'm also, you know, consider myself a general all-purpose cluster jock. So, Okay, well, thanks a lot for taking some time out with us, guys. Uh, so what we're speaking about today is we're going to be talking about building clusters. And I think we're going to stick to the distributed memory you know, the pizza box network MPI kind of cluster. And so first off, we want to discuss what kind of requirements are necessary to look at when specking out a cluster. So why don't we make this kind of an open forum here? Uh, why don't you guys chime in? What what do you guys see customer? I mean, De Jeff, Jeff Layton, you work with customers quite a bit and people who want to buy clusters and whatnot. And Doug, you write a lot about and have a lot of experience working with people who are doing this stuff in the real world. So why don't you guys both chime in with what kind of requirements do you see people do and, uh, and what are the pitfalls of requirements that people forgot about? Um, that, you know, that's kind of the gotchas here. Oh, good, good. I'm going to jump in quick because uh, I'm not shy. Uh, I see a range of requirements and I'll, I'll tell you kind of what I think are good requirements and then bad requirements. The good requirements are, hey, we're looking at uh, HPC. These are the applications we're targeting. We want to talk to you about ways to optimize our cash or optimize the system for a limited amount of cash. And, and so that, you know, that's perfectly great. Let's go in and talk to them, figure out what's going on. The bad ones are where we get a laundry list of parts and we want to quote. Then it becomes, you know, Dell versus IBM versus HP, who's going to give them the lowest price at that particular moment? And that's that's awful. You know, that's from a vendor perspective, that's terrible. But uh, in general, I think most people are pretty good. We do get the give me a laundry list and, and give me a quote. Um, but to kind of go into what I'm seeing right now, my personal bugaboo right now is HPC storage. And we see just awful, terrible requirements for HPC storage. People are just saying, you know, I want 400 terabytes and I have to have it now. And, and they don't talk about what kind of storage, why they need it, how they're going to manage it, how they're going to back it up. No discussion about any of that. And then so then that becomes a uh, tar baby to get into. So anyway, that's kind of what I'm seeing right now. Doug, what, what kind of stuff do people talk to you about? Well, I think um – that's an interesting question. I mean, I, I've run into people that I explain to them, well, they ask me what I do, you know, and I tell them about clustering and they go, well, what could I do with that? And, um, for a lot of people, the answer is, well, not much because they're not in the, they're not in an HPC area, uh, which is, you know, something like where they're doing engineering, or, you know, science or bioinformatics or, you know, chemistry, physics. So the, the areas where HPC seems to be a win are, you know, people who need to do uh, solve numeric type problems, um, usually large scale problems, and also non-numeric uh, bioinformatics type problems. Um, where you have things that, that you know, the, the, the problem doesn't quite fit on your workstation or whatever, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's things that will supplement your research uh, and so forth. So, and, and to, to kind of piggyback on what Jeff said is, um, so at one point in my career, um, I, would, I would go in and help install and sell HPC clusters to people, and I found the best approach was to, 
not come in and lead with hardware, but more sit down with a pencil and paper and say, what is it you want to do? What type of applications do you want to run? What type, and, and look at a couple of things. Um, the processor that would be needed, type of processor, the interconnect, and then the storage. And, and I think, as Jeff mentioned, storage is often the forgotten uncle in all of this. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of like, well, we'll just use NFS, right? And there's been more than one situation where they have the nice shiny cluster in there uh, and the NFS, uh, non-parallel nature of NFS comes back to bite them and they basically have processors waiting on NFS and so forth on storage. So that would be the biggest thing to start is really get a good grasp of what it is you want to do and what you want to accomplish there are, and I think that, again, it, it starts with application areas, and, and maybe we'll, we'll get a little more into that later, what applications. And there are um, some, I would say, you know, in the 80-20 rule, there's, there's probably about 80% um, of the cluster users use 20% of the top applications. So uh, we can, we, like I said, we can probably talk a little bit, that, bit about that later. All right, well, that's a good. Uh, let me let me roll this around back to what what Jeff was saying earlier. Jeff Layton, um, you said the the worst kind of thing that you could uh, see is when a customer just gives you a laundry list of 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 equipment, and because it just turns into a price war. But why exactly? Why is that bad? You know, is it they have they not thought through their requirements and they're just going for the latest sexiest processor, or you know, why why exactly is that bad? Well, you're absolutely right. It it may not be. The best idea because uh, we may know of some trick or some optimization that allows you to get away from those set of requirements. For example, we may know, hey, we've seen this with such and such application. If you go this route, we've seen good, very good performance or very good uh, um, you know, performance per dollar, per watt, or however you want to measure it. Uh, so we, we, it, it, what it does is it gives up the freedom for the vendor to innovate. So any and that's any vendor. I'm just not speaking about Dell. So you know, I'm sure everybody, all the vendors have really great technical people who can come in and talk to them about options. So if you don't do that, you've just painted yourself into a corner, and you're going to get what you get. So let's go ahead and talk about some of those options that are available. Probably the first thing that many people say when I want a cluster, they have a compute problem, so they start thinking about the nodes right away. Um, when they start actually going down, once they kind of have the requirements on paper, should they start looking at nodes right away, or should they look at like network first? Well, that's a that's a good point because ultimately, unless you're, um, you know, maybe NSA or someone, a, a government agency, where <coughs> excuse me, you don't have a budget constraint. Everybody's got a budget constraint, so the issue is. I need to optimize my hardware to get to solve my problem the best, what's going to give me the best performance. And in many cases, it's a nodes versus network. It can be a nodes versus network uh, situation where um, you, you may have a set of problems and find that the standard on onboard Ethernet works fine for your cluster and you can invest more money, more of your budget in nodes, or you may find that, and this is more common now with multi-core, that you really need uh, to use something like InfiniBand or 10 gig E, um, and you, so you need to invest some money of your budget in that direction. So it's really finding that balance that's going to give you the best price performance. And there can also be um, an issue with the node itself in terms of, do I want to uh, go with, um, you know, as as dense a node as I can, which would, or a fat node with lots of processors, lots of memory, or or am I going to be looking at maybe spreading things out a little more because it, it just works better that way. So there's, that's that's some examples of the kinds of things you need to homework you need to do before you sit down and start ordering hardware. The the thing you don't want to do is uh, say, I want the hardware that gives me X number of um, teraflops based on the HPL top 500 benchmark, because unless you're doing that type of 
computing, that benchmark isn't going to help you very much in your design criteria. Doug, say it isn't so that the HPL benchmark does not reflect real performance. <laughs> you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> okay. But, There's uh, no sarcasm in that comment. None. None at all. <laughs> but, you know, the uh, my my pet peeve is when you make your statement that you're the ninth fastest computer in the world, also say, at running this benchmark. <laughs> and I'll, I'll say, good. Uh, <laughs> there you go. So... Um, but that, but there was a time when it was the, if we build it, they will come. We want to be, get on the top 500 list. Here's the list of hardware we want, um, which to me is the the wrong way to go about building a cluster. Absolutely. You, you have to ask the questions, like you said, start with, what are you trying to do? And what are your applications? You know, another thing, too, is... At clusters have been around a long time, so people are now coming around for their second, third, fourth round of clusters. So one thing I like to always ask is, you know, hey, are you, have you been running clusters? If so, what are the problems you've seen? What are the great things you've seen? So you f- kind of find out what the person likes and dislikes because uh, that, you know, that rolls into the to the requirements as well. If, you know, uh, th- we're, I'm going to get a, into a rat hole real quick, but uh, the one that I've seen that really – creates problems is when you start talking about cluster management tools. You know, that, that becomes a, a religious argument, you know, or the beer, which beer is better? You know, it, at some point, and you, you can argue which one's better on some basis, but at some point it, it stops becoming that kind of argument and becomes, I know this tool, so I, I'm very comfortable with it, so I'm going to stick with that. And I think that's a perfectly valid comment. So I, I, I think those kinds of comments in, in RFPs is this has been our experience with clusters, so this is what we're looking for in our next cluster. I think those are absolutely appropriate comments to put in there. All right, good advice. Hey, I, so actually rolling right into that, I'm going to ask about the hardware side of, of cluster management here a little bit. Blades, pizza boxes, what are advantages and disadvantages of, of both here in, in HPC environments? Well, I think my um, what I've been seeing lately is I, I think we're we may be at somewhat of a threshold where the um, price premium that Blades had is getting very close to the cost of the same cost of doing pizza boxes, and um, given the choice between the two, Blades do have an advantage that they normally have shared cooling power, et cetera, which makes it more more of a green solution. They're usually more efficient on power. The cooling is usually a little more efficient because it doesn't have as many small fans running at very high speeds. And, of course, it has the um, usually some built-in management capabilities in the, in the blade itself. Now, that said, you know, one of the reasons people like pizza boxes is the flexibility. It's I, whatever I can fit in there, I can fit in there, and Blades cuts down on some of that. So I think from a cost perspective, Blades are changing a bit, getting a little cheaper. Um, ultimately, and as Jeff Layton alluded to, it's really what works for you, what what kind of uh, situation you need. If you need maximum flexibility, and at some point you're going to want to stick another hard drive in these things, then maybe you better be, you know, go with the pizza box uh, Yep. Now, Jeff, you Jeff Layton probably has some better insight than I do on that. No, I don't know about better, um, but no, I, I agree. It, it all goes back to the application. Uh, like you said, you know, trying to pop an extra couple of hard drives, blades usually don't have that many slots for hard drives, and there's some applications that need a lot of local I/O and centralized high-speed I/O doesn't work, so you need a lot of local. So then, that your application is going to co- start to drive you towards one configuration or the other. Uh, but yeah, now I, I I agree with Doug absolutely. I think blades are kind of at, at a tipping point where they're going to become more popular, and and there is the idea of of the rip and replace concept with the blades. You keep the uh, network infrastructure there, and you just put in new blades. And there is something to that, and it also allows you to maybe mix and match within one chassis, makes things a little bit easier. Uh, and some people like that. 
Uh, on the other hand, though, I've, I've been seeing, and, and Brock, I'll, I'll tease you a little bit since you're at a university, that uh, some of the universities actually like the pizza box approach because after the cluster is kind of done with, let's say it's three years, they like to take those and kind of pass them out. Let's throw them over here to the a- the HR group or over here to accounting that just needs a server to store some database stuff. So I've seen repurposing kind of entering into that. But so, you know, there is no, I don't think, you know, less filling tastes great kind of argument of blades versus uh, pizza boxes to some degree. It just depends on the situation. Well, actually, you bring up how we distribute stuff. It's actually hardware coming in for us that's more of a problem. Our funding models are weird. So far, we've been talking about if you're going to build a big monolithic system, we have problems where people are coming in and they've got you know, thirty grand in a hardware grant. Well, that's not a full blade chassis, so they don't want to pay for the full blade chassis. And pizza boxes, you can just get them. They have a very small per unit price when you're working inside that that funding box. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great point. I forgot about that. Yeah, that's true. Um, I have seen one university. I, I don't want to name them, but what they're doing to kind of counteract that is the centralized IT group is buying all the chassis of the network. And then the faculty just buy the blades as their funding comes up. But I th- the problem with that approach is you've got to plan for it, <laughs> and, and mm-hmm. that's not always easy. But no, absolutely, Brock, I agree with you. I forgot about that point. That's absolutely great point. So what about cooling these things? Um, blades are awfully dense, awfully hot, getting power to a rack. How are you seeing this moving in the future? I, I guess I'll go ahead and jump in first. Um, I- I'll give you kind of a couple of perspectives We've seen machine rooms all over the place to the guys that, you know, the, the cooling air goes maybe a foot up out of the vent and then that's about it. Or they're, they're blowing fans on it all the way up to guys like uh, Mark Seeger, and I'll call out his name because he, he's such a luminary in the HPC field, who's probably got the most gorgeous machine room on the planet. And it's going to be that way for the next 10 years. I mean, he can handle anything that anybody's going to do. And so we've seen everything from end to end. Um, but yeah, in general, the problem with blades, like you pointed out, is density. A lot of facilities can't cool them. They can't get enough cooling air. They don't have enough pressure or, or volume to get it up to the top blades. So yeah, in that case, you, density doesn't buy you anything. Um, but I will say also at the same time, I've seen a number of machine rooms where they're just screaming for things like cold aisle containment or hot aisle containment. Where just by enclosing one of the aisle, aisle or the other, they can solve so many other problems, and it's not that expensive. And so I think there's there's a good way to start, and that's by looking at con- aisle containment. And then I think we'll take probably the next step in density and go to these massively dense systems, uh, blades. And then we're going to have to probably start talking about water cooling. But uh, companies like APC and Liebert have some nice top of the unit rack, uh, top of the rack units. To cool, all self-contained. Same thing with back of the door. APC has some in-row coolers that are pretty nifty. Um, I don't know. I've seen water cooling kind of making a resurgence just because people have it. You know, so th- they turned it off years ago for the old craze, but n- it still works. So let's go ahead and take advantage of it. Yeah, I, I, um, two things. I, I think the um, what they refer to as the rear door heat exchanger type of thing. I think that's going to become a, um, a nice feature. And, and if they have water, um, they actually can use these things to cool other equipment in the, uh, in the data center or in the not data center. And where, what I'm talking about is, um, many of the data centers, and some of the people I've talked to, they, they just don't have the room or power in the data center to put another cluster. And so you may have some guy in a lab that wants to for to do some protein folding, may want to put, you know, 20 nodes in a lab. Well, he can't, he doesn't have the power and cooling, but he definitely can have chilled water and he can get one of these rear door heat exchangers and pop, plop the system in his lab and not have to worry about maintaining a, um, a server room environment. Now the, the, um, computer, systems people of the organization may not agree with that deployment model. Uh, the salespeople certainly like it, but, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, that's one of the things I've seen is, is uh, you know, 
that there's there's just an issue of getting having space and power for some systems. The other thing that I that I um, actually am very happy about is um, the processor vendors, um, which primarily AMD and Intel, are are taking power seriously now. Not that they didn't before. Um, but now it's really become a bullet item in, in uh, many of their presentations and, and part of a sales pitch. And I'll even mention that the new Nehalem, which just recently came out, that has the capability to power down individual cores uh, when not in use and actually on a system power down, um, if you're not using a, a host, uh, power down the memory and, and um, I.O. controllers to... Uh, I believe it's somewhere around 10 watts and in a standby mode, which is, to me, very important because one of the questions I've asked people is when I see one of these big clusters running, I'll say, well, what's your utilization rate? And they might say, well, about 70%. So I'm saying, so 30% of these, or if you have 100 pizza boxes, 30 of them are sitting there basically doing nothing but, you know, acting like good space heaters and they're kind of like well yeah and certainly that's a that's a, some place where we could um, handle the heat better and save money at the same time all right so this kind of is, is another good segue into the next layer up right so being able to selectively power down that that fits into the broader genre of you know the base provisioning and base cluster management so you know getting the right operating system load on there and things like that what do you guys see in this arena there's a whole pile of tools out there that do these things and everybody different features for x and features for y and things like that there's open source ones there's commercial ones and every vendor's got their own favorite tools and things like that what do you guys see people using and what do you see as uh successes and, and failures in this area well, this is uh, Doug Edline. From from my standpoint, uh, I'm a bit biased. I want to be upfront about that, and I think Jeff Layton probably is a little bit as well. We we prefer a diskless provisioning model, um, and that basically means that when the node is booted, that it gets its operating system image and any other files from some central server location and really has no a uh, hard drive on this on the node that's responsible for for holding an OS image that does not mean the, the node can ha cannot have hard drives on the contrary it can have a scratch disk hard drive or any number of hard drives um, the other way of doing it is the kind of the opposite of that is where you have an image on every every node on a hard drive so each node is like its own little island and it it can boot no matter what it it will just just boot up and uh whenever you turn it on the using a um a a non-local boot option or a uh diskless provisioning means it has to that has to have a server up and running in order to to get the image and the the reason I like the um, diskless approach is it lets you manage the entire software stack that goes on the node from one location. And and it, again, uh, this is this can be very controversial. A lot of people have different opinions about it. This comes from my experience of trying to manage clusters. That I have a couple of rules that if there is a Hard, if there's available storage somewhere, like a hard drive, uh, users will write to it. I don't know why. They just seem to find it and write to it. Um, and inevitably, the, uh, the nodes develop what I call personalities. And oftentimes, you, you, you run into trouble with cluster management trying to manage the personalities of the nodes. Did this get upgraded on this node? Did that one get upgraded on this node? And um, there are ways to uh, manage that with shooting images around and re-imaging a node and so forth. And um, that's one way of solving the problem. But when you have everything concentrated on a server, you can make one change, and every time you, you just need to reboot boot the node, and then the change is there. 
So that that's kind of the, the two the two approaches people take in in doing this, and I'm sure Jeff, you have some input on that as well. Oh, I absolutely agree with you. I, you hit a, Doug and I have been, by the way, Doug and I have been friends for a long time. He, I was actually one of his customers when he had a when he had uh, his company. But no, I, I agree. I think I, I love it for all that those reasons. Um, but I do one of the other pet peeves that Doug didn't mention that he and I always chat about is this idea of taking job schedulers. And allowing, if the note isn't being used, to allow, just have it power down. So the job scheduler powers it down, and it has to keep track of it. So if a job comes in and it's needed, it'll power it back up. And, and Doug and I have been wanting this for a long time, and you know I've heard of some possibilities. Some people have kind of sort of developed this, but uh, you know I don't know if it's been tested out in, in a widespread. I don't know. Maybe, maybe Jeff has Squires knows a little bit more about that. But I think that's another. Th- uh, avenue, I think that people can address, and it needs to be addressed as a community. Yeah, to be honest, I would love to see something like that as well, because uh, you know, my in Cisco, my MPI development clusters, you know, fifty some nodes or so, and there are times when I actually do have nodes idle, and I, I feel bad that I'm just kind of burning electricity while they're sitting there waiting for the next job to come off the queue, and you know, the nightly jobs are done, and and they don't have anything to do until you know tomorrow night. Um, and sometimes it's usually just a couple hours worth of waste, but still, it's it's waste that could be better managed. And uh, you know, if someone's got a better solution for that, I would love to hear it. Yep, absolutely. Doug and I have been threatening to do it, and we we haven't. And <laughs> but uh, I'd like to see somebody do it I, I, on on any basis, commercial and open source. Doug and I, that's another one of our pet peeves is we're kind of open source supporters, but at the same time, we see the need for uh, commercial. But uh, we'd like to see somebody take the bull by the horns and do it. I um I do if I have this correctly I believe the the one of the and we're kind of stepping into batch systems now and uh which is fine one of the the lighter weight batch systems called Slurm um I believe that is part of the next release it's going to be power system power control um I know there are some people uh who are trying to work with that with Sun Grid Engine I, there's actually a I've read some things about it I don't know if they have anything implemented and I'm sure the other um, the other scheduler that's popular open source scheduler Torque um, that, that they're looking at that as well and I am absolutely sure Platform uh, is looking at that as well with their commercial product so I think it's something everybody's looking at um, I don't think it's it's there just yet and um i would love to play with it it does bring up there there are some you know it's it it sounds like a simple idea there are some issues as to um you know how how do you actually implement that and um other thing we didn't mention about dynamic um provisioning or bootless uh, diskless provisioning is that it's quicker than non uh having a disk on the system so when you do these dynamic boots, reboots, power downs, it, the system can boot up a lot quicker. And one other advantage we didn't mention about that is it's possible to have this different system images that can boot on the nodes. So, for instance, if you need a certain version kernel package, you can actually customize that for a specific node or group of nodes and, and boot those nodes with that image. So you could... You could potentially even have a SUSE set of images and a Red Hat set of images, and it gives you a, a bit more flexibility. So, I actually, uh, this is a story that I like to hear because um, one of the one of the trends in HPC that I've been hearing recently, and when I say trend, I mean trendy, that people are saying, "Wow, we should use virtualization in HPC." So that, uh, you know, I can have my job have this one gets Suzy and this one gets Red Hat, this one gets Chaos Linux, this one gets Debian, this one gets whatever application load they need. And we can just load whatever virtual machine we like. And I've, I've always been kind of dubious of that model for exactly what, uh, what you just mentioned there, Doug, that, uh, well, you know, just get yourself a good diskless provisioning and then you don't have all the complexity of virtual machines. You can just pick which image to load rather than trying to virtualize the network and virtualize this and virtualize that. And uh, a lot of these other layers just kind of disappear and you get the same end functionality. Yeah, 
go ahead, Doug. Yeah, the uh, the, the one thing why you mentioned virtualization is, and and um, I think it's a great idea. I, I I really like the idea, and at the same time, in HPC there are a and Jeff Squires and Layton, you know this very well. There's a lot of people that spend a lot of time getting software as close to the hardware as possible for the best performance. And, you know, virtualization kind of has uh, the opposite in a, in a way to virtualize hardware. And therein lies the, the rub, I think, with HPC at this point is um, – we want to be as close to the hardware as possible where virtualization wants to move us away a little bit. So that's why I, I, I think there's going to be some virtualization play in HPC, but I don't, I don't see it uh, as most people do. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I think Doug, dead on. Um, I, th- I think the problem. I, I love Jeff's idea about well, you just as part of the job, you just say what. App, what OS, what distribution, what you want, and it, it just – it's got an image created and it fires it off. But I think that like a lot of things in HPC, the devil's in the details because now what you're doing basically is re-imaging the nodes. So how does a job scheduler keep track because a job scheduler usually puts a daemon on there and they communicate. So you have this kind of problem. I'm not exactly sure how to solve that or, or there's got to be a good way to do it or you just bite the bullet and you just – tell the job scheduler you know just it's a brand new node and has no idea of state so i i I think that's a great approach i like that approach and and like doug said you know this idea of virtualization is becoming so trendy i i can't tell you how many times people have said hey i've got a new idea for doing virtualization at hpc and then you start drilling into it and you find out that well they can't the big problem like doug said is performance from what i've seen when you start running VMs and you're going to run an application at the VM, you're taking like a 30% hit in network performance. You're going to take a big hit in net and IO performance. And so first thing you're going to do is you're, you're going to pay the VM tax. So I've got and, and to buy more hardware to get to basically the same throughput. And then the next thing that people usually like to do in a VM, the, the argument is, well, if the node looks like it's suspect and it may die, I could do – I can move it while it's running to another node. In, in the VM world, they call it vMotion. So I could vMotion the app to another node. Great idea. Except if you're trying to do, a, if you've got a lot of I/O going on, or you've got a lot of network traffic, how do you do that? How do you intercept it all on the fly and remap it to another node? Do you just stop it and then move it? So I th- the devil's in the details on a lot of this stuff with with virtualization, and and I like it. The best story I've ever heard is actually my boss, Tim Carroll. And people probably know him in the HPC world. He's been around for a while as well. And, and his good, his, the best analogy is with HPC, you're trying to take a lot of nodes and make them work like one. In virtualization, you're trying to take one node and make it look like a whole bunch of machines. So they're kind of opposite approach. I, I can see it maybe being used for certain circumstances, but as a general overall trend, until we solve a lot of problems, I don't quite see it coming out yet i I don't know jeff is that kind of matched up with what you've been seeing and thinking yeah pretty much um i I should backpedal a little bit so i don't get in trouble with my uh with my employer here virtualization is certainly great in a lot of environments and it has a lot of really good uses i'm i'm specifically limiting my remarks to the hpc world where i i think i'm agreeing pretty much entirely with you guys that uh you know virtualization is is a, a great technology but not so much in the hpc arena um, it, uh, it, it introduces more problems than it solves. You know, like Jeff, you were talking about some of the problems with, all right, well, now the scheduler's got to be involved somehow, and you got to either have images with a, a new scheduler daemon on it, or, you know, there's, there's a lot of conditions and things that need to be solved before this is even fe- feasible. You know, what I mentioned before of just boot a, a new image for that particular job. But it, my personal view is that those are easier problems to solve than the problems that virtualization adds in an HPC kind of climate. Kind yeah, of and, and thanks for that, uh, That I don't know what you call it, limited segue that you usually hear at the end of the commercial at about 14,000 characters a second. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. This is all about HPC. Virtualization is fantastic for certain fields. And by the way, I'm speaking for myself, not necessarily for my employer. So I just want to get that in there as well. <laughs> 
wanted to ask one more question here before we, we, we digressed a little bit there into job schedulers, but before we completely leave the, the hardware arena, you know, what's your guys' take on you know multiple login nodes, multiple administration nodes, I.O. nodes? I mean, I know a lot of this comes back to requirements, but uh, I just like to see, you know, what do you guys see out on the street? What do you see in the world? How many do people just do with one login node or, you know, what do, the, what do, what do people do? Well, uh, from my standpoint, um, a, a lot of people don't know that they can have multiple login nodes. And um, so the uh, – and, and that is also a function of what scheduler you use and so forth. And and, um, and for those that, that – um, and I, I – I want to back up a minute because I just, when we were talking about this, I just thought if I'm out there listening to this and these guys are talking about schedulers and all this kind of stuff, and some people may not realize how a user uses a cluster. So, you know, we're all used to sitting down at our desktop, laptop, whatever, and having complete access and, and running a program and having it run when things happen when we wanted to. Well, on a cluster, we've kind of we in a way we take a step back to the old days of batch systems where you submit your job with a certain resource requirement and then when those resources are available it runs on the cluster and then your results come back to you so it's a, it's a it's a different mode of operating many times than most people are used to and um this this is required because we can have for instance you know, 20 people logging into the head node of the cluster, each trying to run a job and use different compute nodes because they'll be stepping on each other and and um, the, the nodes will be overwhelmed with jobs and so forth and so on. And the scheduler basically takes care of that. So I, um, I think that's a good thing to remember. And now I've, of course, forgot the question Jeff Squires asked. <laughs> <laughs> what I was asking about was login nodes and administrative nodes and, you know, non-core back-end cluster nodes. What do you guys see? Because I, I imagine that's also largely a function of uh, budget as well. And size. Uh, it's, it's important. A smaller cluster, you can have one node that does all of that. It can, it, it can function as the node that runs the administrative software, which, which in many cases is Ganglia, which is a way to uh, watch what's going on in the cluster. It can run the scheduling software, and it can uh, function as a login node. As the cluster gets bigger, these tasks can be broken out to separate nodes. And in particular, administration nodes uh, can be important for a couple reasons is you want to keep that away from end users. Um, uh, not that an end user would ever do something they weren't supposed to do, but it's a good idea. Some people think it's a good idea to keep the administration stuff on a, uh, completely on a separate node. And the same thing with scheduler. Sometimes the, the actual scheduler is running, um, monitoring jobs and and watching the cluster so much, the batch scheduler, that it, it really should have a separate node uh, to, to handle things. And the same thing goes with logins. If you have lots of different people logging in and then they submit their job, to, and, and when they log in, they may be compiling on that node, getting their job ready to run, and then they submit the job to the scheduler, which then, as the resources become available, it runs. So. Yeah, no, it, uh, that's absolutely true. And, and and a rule of thumb I use for customers, and, and this is totally my rule of thumb, and I'm, I know it's probably wrong, but uh, for about every 25 users that are on the system simultaneously, I kind of recommend another login node. So if you've got 25 people doing whatever, throw another login node in there because by that time the cluster is probably pretty big anyway, and one extra node isn't going to you know, kill it as far as cost goes. But, yeah, Doug's absolutely right. You start small and grow it. Uh, I like to see for bigger systems uh, a second node, a, a node dedicated just for the job scheduler so you could do failover. So if the, the node dies, it will fail over to the other one and the jobs won't die. Uh, the separate management node, I like to keep that separate for bigger systems. Uh, and then storage as well. I mean, you know, Doug and I have our own secret 
basement clusters that we've been building for years. And, and we, so we've got a head node that does everything, including act as the storage node or the, for NFS. But as, as things get bigger, you can't – you overwhelm the node, so you got to kind of split that out as well. But at the same time, I think Jeff's probably got that tone in his voice that, okay, now I'm making my management problem about a thousand times more difficult. And that's absolutely true. I think there's – at some point, you're just going to get overwhelmed. But this is my one and only kind of Dell pitch is that Dell and uh, another 11 companies, including Sun and Intel and a few others. Uh, hey, and Cisco also- too. Cisco, yep, sorry. I thought I, it was Cisco. I throw it in there. <laughs> I thought Cisco was there, but I couldn't – to be honest, I can never remember. But uh, the idea is we all put uh, some money and a vested interest in collaborating with uh, Lawrence Livermore to create this system called Hyperion. And what Hyperion is to look at is, this, is scaling, to look at scaling of OS, scaling of management, scaling of job scheduler because we're, we're starting to look at systems with thousands and thousands of nodes. How do you manage that? You know, you don't want 46 login nodes and a whole bunch of different other nodes that you got to run around and manage. So how are we going to tackle that kind of problem? So Mark Seeger at, at Lawrence Livermore has kind of led this project and, and Cisco and Dell and Sun and Intel and a, a number of other companies. And I apologize if I, I miss your company. Um, please let us know which one it is because I, I can never remember. I apologize. But uh, everybody has a vested interest in uh, Red Hat. I'm sorry. I need to include Red Hat since I'm a, such a Linux fan. All looking at this problem of how do we tackle I, I call it scaling of the admin you know we always laugh that uh, admins don't scale well uh, we've got to figure out a way to tackle that problem because the systems are just getting too big okay well moving on um the concept of the scheduler came up quite often and it really sounds like the the cluster revolves around a scheduler uh, what kind of schedulers you guys see out there um what's some of the more creative uses of a scheduling policy you've seen on a cluster Well, that's a good question. Um, some of my experience has been that um, users have difficulty with scheduling policies. <laughs> and um, that sounds you, very politically correctly phrased, there, Doug. When when you when they complain about how they would like to see the cluster work and you ask them to come up with a policy of how they want things to work and then that doesn't seem to happen, then it just kind of runs in the default mode, I guess is <laughs> the way to say it. Um, and and there are some cases where people take advantage of, of cluster scheduling policies which can be very, very complicated. And um, SunGrid Engine, for example, and I'll, I'm mentioning that because I'm most familiar with it, has some fairly sophisticated scheduling methodologies. And um, it's the kind of thing that's very, very uh, organization dependent. And it, it gets in, the, the trouble I see with it, it gets into organizational politics and thereby uh, creates some issues. So, and by the way, um, the, the, the the three main open source schedulers are Torque slash Mali, usually um, SunGrid Engine, and the other one's Slurm, and and that's from Lawrence Livermore as well. And Slurm is kind of more targeted towards clusters, where the other the other open source applications are more. Um, uh, organizational wide in a sense, and uh, the other one, like I mentioned, platform uh, has a scheduling product as well. So uh, that's that's my politically correct answer to that question. So yeah, Doug, it, let me put you on the spot here a little bit. Here, you you were talking at the fifty thousand foot level, and I, I gotta I gotta take you back to a comment you said earlier for. For someone who's listening to this podcast who has no idea about HPC clusters and whatnot, that might be a little too high. I wonder if you could ground this in a, in a couple of uh, real-world examples you've seen or maybe even some hypothetical examples. But you know, give us, give us a little more detail on what you were talking about in terms of why policies are difficult and how things can get complicated and you know, what works best from what you've seen. Well, I'll give you – here's an example. Um, uh some clusters I'm involved in come from uh, various funding sources. 
So there'll be a certain number of nodes that are owned by a certain group that um, have exclusive use of those nodes. And then there are, there are other nodes who, uh, and the exclusive use is dictated by the grant. They're, they're, they are not allowed to share the hardware. And then in other situations, they will bring some nodes to the table in exchange for using other nodes in the cluster when their nodes aren't available. So in, in that case, you may have a group, your scheduling policy may have to have certain people of this group can use only these nodes, or they can use all the nodes of the cluster, or you can have someone who can uh, says that it, we have a higher priority on these nodes, and we get them first, and if we're not using them, someone else can, can have access to them. So that's, a, that's an example of one of, of a situation that uh, crops up in some, I would say, multi-sourced clusters where schedulers can come into play. Another uh, area where schedulers come into play is where you have the, um, I would say, the separate, uh, separate hardware clusters. So, for example, five years ago, you bought a 128-node cluster, and last year you upgraded that with 64 nodes now. Well, now you have two different processors and they're just and uh, memory prints and so forth. So which is a resource and your your scheduling software, uh, you can ask for certain resources and that way you make sure that you're not using half old nodes, half new nodes and 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 running things um, in a in a really you know, off-centered kind of way. So there's, it's, it's, the scheduler can also be used to sort out hardware issues. In addition, there are some clusters that have uh, fat memory nodes where certain jobs just need gobs and gobs of memory, and those, those nodes um, a, a user would have to submit as part of their job. I need this much, I need a node with this much memory, and then they would wait in the queue until that node was available and it would it would be used. So I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but um, it does happen. And you know, it's and you the, the biggest question you have is any system admin will have is my job's in the queue. Why isn't it running? And um, the uh, the answer to that can be uh, lots of different reasons, some of which are political, some of which are resource constraints, and some of which are uh, user error. Yeah, it, but I, I, I'll jump in, Doug, and also say for you admins out there, this kind of question, why is it my job running, is a chance for you to make a little bit of extra money and just say, <laughs> well, for 50 bucks, I can make it run a lot faster. So <laughs> I've used that argument occasionally. It's never gone anywhere, but uh, – and I, I – I, Having been a user, you know, for a number of years, I, I'll tell you one situation where it was interesting because I worked at a large aerospace company. So we have a number of projects, and we each share the same machine. But under each project, you have various disciplines, and under each discipline, you have various sub projects. And the relative importance of those sub projects would change day to day, depending upon the situation. So. Every day, we had a manager who sat down with the team and every day juggled the policies. You know, okay, who's got higher priority today versus this one? And it was a nightmare for the manager. We didn't find a better solution at the time, but so it, it could get into a quagmire and it's awful. So I kind of default to first in, first out, just the old FIFO uh, kind of thing. Although the Maui scheduler itself is pretty good about backfilling. So if you've got a job that's blocking let's say you got a job that's waiting for 18 nodes but you got 16 free it's just waiting for those last two but there's maybe a 16 node job that could run right away you know the maui does a good job of backfilling for that kind of thing so it, it gets really complex and there's lots of research papers written about it and you know there's no perfect solution yet you know people are still still looking at that but uh, oh by the way i wanted to mention one other thing doug was talking about open source you know, LSF is, is a big commercial product that, that's very, very good. Um, Cluster Resources has Moab, which has gotten a lot of tra uh, traction lately. But actually, the platform people have open-sourced 
an older version of LSF. I think it's like version four, and they call it Lava. Uh, so if you look at some of the platform's open cluster stack, their OCS products, you'll find Lava in there, and it's total open source. So, I mean, if you like LSF uh, and you're comfortable with LSF 4 and you can build it, it, it's totally out there for you. So it's another option people could consider. So, Jeff, you, you tossed out a couple names there, and we haven't done a good job here in this conversation. Can you distinguish between the scheduler and the resource manager? I knew you were going to ask me that question because you <laughs> lectured me this one time in an email, and you were absolutely right because I blew the definition. Yeah, there's, there's, there's two bits to the whole scheduling running, and there's one that actually does the scheduling and there's one that does kind of the resource management. And and so what you do is you have a scheduler that actually figures out what job should run next based on some criteria. And the resource manager's job is to actually take that information and to go make the application run on whatever hardware is assigned to it. So I, I, that's at a high level at, in my little brain. I think that's kind of the definition, Jeff. I, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, that's, that's yeah. It just it's dividing it into those two things: the guy who makes the decision, and then the guy who actually does the action. Right. So the decision maker is the the scheduler, and the action guy is the resource manager. He actually goes and launches your job and monitors it, and then when your job is done, cleans it all up, and then asks the scheduler for the next thing to do, and and so on. And so we were we were throwing around a lot of names here. So let's let's assign scheduler and resource manager. Uh, to each one of those. Can you go through each of those things and say, you know, which is a scheduler, which is a resource manager, and which one's both? Oh, boy. that's I'll do my best and then correct me. Let's put it that way. Uh, so <laughs> this, is, this is Jeff's final exam for, for me. Um, yeah, don't get it wrong. There's a penalty <laughs> here. Yeah. Oh, man, I already went through grad school. I don't want to do it again. Um, okay, Torque is, is, a, is a resource manager, but it has a scheduler, a fundamental scheduler in there. It's called FIFO, first in, first out. And so it's just the first person to get in the queue gets to run first and so on. Uh, you can you can tweak it and do some programming of your, your own if you want to do the write a scheduler. Um, MAUI is a scheduler that plugs into it. Uh, on S, uh, the Sun Grid Engine. And, and that, is, would, that would supersede the FIFO that, yeah. that Torque the real basic ones you can you can put in say maui or or one of the others that uh you know allows you to do something much much more complex but use the torque as the resource manager a- absolutely so yeah it, perfect and sun grid engine is is can do both as well and i think maui fits into sun grid engine doug knows that a bit better than i do yeah you uh, can someone shoehorned it in you can use it if you want to and let's see, Lava is the same way, and LSF is. It's it has it's both a scheduler and uh, a resource manager, and and the one I don't know as well is Moab, and I think Moab is more of the scheduler. Yeah, Moab's not- a scheduler. So Moab and Maui are just pure schedulers. Right. Okay. Good. And, I didn't and- flunk that one. Yeah, there you go. And and Slurm is, is just like uh, Torque, right? It's got a basic FIFO one. Uh, scheduler, but it's primarily a resource manager, and you can plug in any of the pure schedulers into there. Although I, I do believe they have announced they're uh, uh, progressing more into the scheduler direction themselves. They're going to have Slurm is going to contain more sophisticated things than FIFO in in future releases. Yeah, and and real quick, one I always forget to, and this is, is kick me in the head because I've used it for years. PBS Pro. Altair owns that now. So we talk about Torque is kind of the open source fork of PBS from years ago, and it's developed, and then there's PBS Pro as well. But um, And then there's kind of grid schedulers, but, we're boy, we're going to go down a rat hole on that one. So I'll skip that. But I, I know what Jeff has been very good and very polite, but one of his lectures for me, and it was really good, and I'm glad he did it because I didn't understand it. And since he's leading the Open MPI project is a lot of times you need the resource manager tied in to the MPI layer because the resource manager may kill the job or may not and you have zombie processes running around and you're it's they're chewing up CPU cycles it's a mess so they I think I agree that they need to be plugged in to each other and and to some degree even the MPI can also just be the the resource manager itself I, I think that's maybe one kind of extreme example so End user software stack. Uh, if you had just a generic resource cluster, like at an average university, where there's all sorts of applications site provide. 
Well, there's a simple question. Um, in general, for for users, um, there's uh, you need compilers and you need MPI, which stands for Message Passing Interface Libraries, and um, that's at a, at a minimum. And uh, if you have turnkey applications that can be pre-compiled, uh, th those should be provided as well. So the, um, beyond that, there are things like debuggers, profilers that work in a parallel environment, which, by the way, is not an easy thing to do. Um, and uh, as we already mentioned, there's administrative software needed as well from the end user standpoint. Beyond the, the open source compilers, the GNU compilers, there are in, in the HPC world in general, and this is also, I may get some heat for this, uh, Intel has a good, the other one that has uh, gained some favor in recent years is Pascal. Um, Portland and Pascal are more targeted towards AMD processors, where Intel obviously is targeted towards Intel processors. MPI libraries, um, if anybody knows of a good open source MPI library, I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are hard to come by, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah, they sure are. Um, and, and while I, while I have this, uh, just a, a moment here, I, I, I do want to mention something about the role of open source software and clustering. Um, in, in, in clustering, I, I believe that open source software is not about saving money. It's where we see the real tr value of free use and openness in software where things can be changed and adapted to suit end users' needs. And if there were ever a, a, an example of um, where the, the open source model fits, I would say would be with, with clustering. And everybody involved um, I would would probably agree with me that we have made such progress in HPC clustering because, as I call it, the plumbing is open. And you can do things in terms of file systems, operating systems, MPI libraries, and so forth that you couldn't do uh, if everything was closed. It would be much – well, you could do it, but it would be much more difficult. So – and and it's not to um, say there's – that commercial software shouldn't be used. I believe it's important. It should be used. And it's also that, that uh, open source software has, has really been a big value add in the cluster world. Yeah, at, amen, Reverend Edline. It, <laughs> absolutely. And it's, it is not a matter of cost. And I think pretty much everybody in the open source world understand, or should understand that it's not a matter of cost. It's it's a matter of being open. And, you know, there's a quick historical note. One of the early cluster guys, that, uh, and Doug, I can't remember his name, at NASA, actually found a bug in the TCP stack. And by changing a few things, managed to improve the TCP performance hugely. And his patch would run around for years. So if it was closed, that would never, ever happen. So you know, it, I, I agree. It's it, the software stack. You need that uh, as a minimum. Uh, you can mix and match commercial versus open source versus uh, commercially supported open source, which I think we're starting to see more of as well. Um, and, and and to kind of go on to the next level, to you can also add uh, provisioning tools. You know, the Oscars of the world, Werewolf, Perseus, XCAT. I mean, we can name thousands of them, uh, OCS from platform. Uh, so that's a way to image the nodes or provision them. That's kind of another layer. The next layer is monitoring, finding out what's going on with the nodes, although I think people sometimes focus on that a little too much, and they start eating up their network just trying to, you know, okay, I, you don't need to look at uptime every five seconds. You know, it's not going to change that much. Uh, and so, and one thing that we also probably didn't talk about is the OS itself. It can be an open source, such as Linux, of course. It can even be closed source, such as Windows. We're, you know, so uh, we have to look at you have to look at what the requirements are for the application and, and what the uh, user requirements are as well. 
Actually, I would add to that list. Um, I always like to have a the right blast library around for the hardware you're running on. Oh yeah. You, don't tell me, Brock. You're going to run the top 500, right? Me? Heck no. Heck no. I don't want. <laughs> no, that I will. I will throw a plug in. Okay. I mean, Doug was. We we're all teasing about the, the HPL, the top 500, but I have used it in the past to help debug nodes, nodes that don't seem to be performing well. So I have used it as a way to figure out which nodes in the cluster maybe have an issue and then so I can focus on those. So it is useful in that. And I do like to use the high-speed BLAS library so I can make sure I get the best performance so I can start to look for those differences. So, And for those not in the know there, BLAS, uh, the B-L-A-S, the basic linear algebra subroutines, those are uh, what we're referring to here is very highly tuned uh, mathematical subroutines that can you know run really really well on whatever your particular platform is and there's a variety of different blas implementations out there tuned for different types of uh, platforms and, and, and I want to go on record subroutine. I want to go on record as saying I I support the top 500 benchmark <laughs> as it's intended to be used so I <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I do I do believe it's a it's a tremendous amount a historic measurement of it has a lot of history in it and measurement of the market and technologies. Um, my version to it is that it gets overused in in the wrong way. So oh, yeah. and and it it, it uh, there's that that's all I need to say. And the other thing I wanted to say before we run out of time, um, there's a little bit of a plug. Um, uh, Jeff Layton has written a uh, article on cluster monkey called how to write a technical cluster RFP where a lot of the things we talked about today are um, carefully um, presented by Jeff and really worth reading if you're interested in what's important in proposing a cluster or understanding what's in a cluster. So to, to find that you can just go to cluster monkey or one word dot net and type in in the search bar box RFP, and uh, it'll come up in one of the, the options there. And while you're there, th we have tutorials on Cluster Monkey. Um, actually, one very good MPI tutorial written by uh, Jeff Squires. So um, it's a it's a community resource. Uh, we have lots of good good content, and there's no registration or anything that required. And uh, you can go there and and check it out. Neat, neat. No, I, I think I'll include a link to that uh, how to write an RFP in the uh, notes for the show when it goes out. Yeah, oh, that's going to get some email. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be getting RFPs. That's yeah. <laughs> I'm a tech guy. I don't do sales. <laughs> <laughs> hey, by the way, I wanted to make one quick comment that, uh, Jeff, when you were talking about Blast, you used the word subroutine, and I think you just dated yourself as a Fortran, Fortran. guy, much as I am. God, it, it's horrible because I'm the guy, the poor schlep who's uh, tasked with taking care of all the Fortran and OpenMPI. It's awful, awful, awful. <laughs> uh, but that, that is certainly our contribution to open source because, you know, keeping up the Fortran APIs has – Absolutely nothing to do with selling Cisco hardware. I'll tell you that. Oh, and it's I, I'm a, I love Fortran, and I, I, I you know I'm. Do they have an Alcoholics Anonymous for Fortran users? But I, I <laughs> and it's partly because I used it, but uh, I can also think in other languages. But so I I truly appreciate the fact that you guys still pay attention to Fortran. Uh, there's a, there's a, quite a bit of Fortran still out there. I mean, uh, that is. Don't get me started on an MPI rant here, but you know this is this is why MPI defined a Fortran API for it because there's a huge amount of Fortran code out there that they they they're not computer scientists. They're not even necessarily very good computer programmers. They're physicists and biologists, and at the end of the day, they just want to use their cluster. They just want to solve their problem. They don't. They don't know how the computer works. They don't care how the network works. They just, they just want their stuff to run, and they want it to run in you know two hours rather than two weeks. And and that's what it's that's what it's all about. I mean, that's kind of everything we've been talking about here for the, the last hour, hour and a half. Is you know how do you get a resource like that and the six million things that are necessary to enable that physicist to be able to just run their job, right? Absolutely. It's all about the users. App, uh, always. That's why I like it. What do you want to do with the cluster? So I want to know who's on it, what kind of applications, what do they like. That that good good point. 
Okay, guys. Well, I think that's a good spot to kind of wrap it up from here. Thank you very much for taking some time out and speaking with us. Uh, again, clustermonkey.net. Get a hold of Jeff at Dell. Um, and check out rce-cast.com. Fill out the nomination form for other projects you guys would like to hear. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank thanks. you. Let me know. Thanks a lot.